You're listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And we are joined by Daniel Freib. Hello, chaps. How's it going? Daniel, how are you, Daniel? You're in Berlin. Yep, I'm all right. I'm all right. We're in a square in London. I'm, I've am i hauled myself out of my sick bed. I'm not, not very well. Going beyond the call of duty, aren't you? A little bit, yep. yeah. Yeah. We're but in Golden Square, which uh, is freezing cold, but... Uh, quite appropriate given it's World Championship week. Indeed. And we've just watched the men's time trial in the Rafa Cafe here in Soho. Lionel, you and I will talk about that in part one. We've got men's time trial, women's time trial, the team time trials to talk about. We're going to indulge in a little bit of speculation. I'm looking ahead to the, the road races. And in the final part, we're going to hear from our old friend Francois Tomizo, who joined us at the Tour de France, of course. And he was out in Canada recently for the World Tour races there and uh, spoke to some interesting people, including Tyler Farrar, who is uh, retiring at the end of this season. So we'll hear from Francois. Nice to hear from him again. But before all that, in this first podcast, after the Vuelta, Lionel, the yes. news roundup, please. <laughs> You said that like it was I'm a bit, some revelation. I'm just a bit <laughs> slow because, as I say, I, I've hauled myself out my sick oh, bed to be you here. You and Peter Sagan both feeling a bit under the weather in... I actually didn't know that. Is he under yeah, the weather? he's been a bit under the weather, apparently. Mm. Did he have his wisdom tooth out the other day as well, like me? I don't think so. I think we probably have heard about that. But let's uh, crack on with talk about the World Championships because they're taking place in Bergen in Norway at the moment. It's been a fantastic week for Team Sunweb because they did the double in the team time trials. They won the women's event followed by the men's event. It's uh, been a fantastic year all round for Sunweb, both the men's and women's squads. The women lined up with Ellen van Dyke, Corinne Rivera and Lucinda Brand among their lineup, and they beat Balls Dolmans and Cervelo Bigler into second and third places and then the men basically took inspiration and did the double Tom de Moulin, Michael Matthews and Wilco Kelderman were their biggest names in the team and they beat BMC Racing who've won the team time trial a couple of times I think in the past and Team Sky who are yet to win the team time trial and they had Chris Froome and Geraint Thomas on a, a rare off day in their side side that's more a football rugby term isn't it in their team <laughs> they needed to substitute Garant Thomas at one <laughs> point didn't they <laughs> they did yeah they could if they could have substituted Garant Thomas before that hill they possibly would have done the individual time trials then kicked off the highlights uh, from the races prior to today's men's race uh, Britain's Tom Pidcock won the junior men's race quite an impressive performance by him He's added that to the junior cyclocross title that he won at the World Championships at the start of the year. He's also won the junior Paris-Roubaix, of course, and that's not him pulling away on a motorbike behind us. Um, he's still, well, he'll still be in Bergen, I assume, doing the, doing the road race before the weekend. The women's time trial was won by Annemiek van Vluten. It's just over a year since she had that horrible crash in the road race at the Olympic Games in Rio. People probably remember that as a real sort of heart-stopping moment on that descent. So a big result for Van Vluten beating her compatriot Anna van der Bregen into second place. And it's been the perfect week really for the Dutch because Tom de Moulin then won the men's time trial, which we're going to talk about in uh, a bit more detail in part one. Just a little bit of off-the-bike news from the UCI's various meetings this week. It's been confirmed that team sizes at Grand Tours next year will be reduced from nine riders to eight and all other races will be reduced from eight to seven. So that will have some sort of impact on all of the racing next year. We'll no doubt discuss that in a future podcast. The election of the UCI president is also taking place this week. Um, so you may well be listening to this after the election result so either Brian Cookson or David Lepachon won that <laughs> brilliant that's a, that's a good bit of speculation right there yeah that's that, is that the end of it Lionel is that the end of the news round up that, that's the end of it that's yeah. it yeah Nothing else Nothing else to mention from the world of sport? Oh, Lionel? yeah, the, uh, the cycling <laughs> podcast Daniel Free finished a, a, a not-too-bad 12th in the uh, British Speed Golf Open. How was it? Uh, it, was, it was fantastic. I was disappointed that you didn't introduce me. In fact, I might insist, I might have it written into my contract. I'm henceforth, introduced, henceforth introduced as Britain's 12th best speed golfer. <laughs> 
golfer <laughs> until next year when I'm going to be eleven Were the 11 people who finished ahead of you all British? Um, no, actually, because yeah. the world the world number one was there. A guy called Wes Cup from the U- from Seattle, I think he is. Anyway, there were quite a few Americans who finished ahead of me. Yeah, a bit of an Alizabeldia performance, though, Daniel. I'm not sure that you'll have um, set the heather on fire with 12th place. Did people sit up and take notice? Did they remember you from your previous winning? I'm surprised you haven't been watching Swedish TV. It was um, it was covered in great detail in a Swedish. <laughs> Um, TV news bulletin Mundo Deportivo in Spain the Spanish newspaper covered it La Repubblica in Italy it's been all over the European press anyway really the cycling <laughs> podcast shouldn't be covering it but um, as we I, have I indulged feel... you Daniel we ought to explain that speed golf is basically a round of golf but you have to run between shots um, yeah. so it's kind of s- speeding up the game of golf from a, an unbearable five hours to uh, 51 a, a more minutes. bearable f- 51 minutes I think Is that was that faster yeah. than Tom Dumoulin's time trial today I feel we might have already spent too long, too long on this. Just next the point week, of order, though, next Dan, week Richard. we'll uh, do Lionel playing croquet at the weekend. <laughs> be Slow quite croquet, fun, yeah. Um, just a point of order, though, Richard. You you described Daniel's result as Ala Zubeldia, but to be fair, Ala Zubeldia, you have to finish in the top ten for that. He generally manages the top ten, any, didn't he? Anyway. <laughs> It was on the verge of being a Maxi Montfortesque performance, wasn't it? Slightly better than that. <laughs> well, well anyway, done anyway. Yeah, uh, no, well, well done. Very, we're very proud of you, <laughs> uh, Daniel. You're definitely the best speed golfer among the three of us. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, well, the time trial, I mean, it was uh, builds a two-horse race between Tom Dumoulin and Chris Froome. That's the men's time trial today. And, and it wasn't really that because Dumoulin was absolutely invincible. I uh, was just sort of... I think we're all looking ahead to, to next year and the battle perhaps in the in Tour de France between Chris Froome and Tom Dumoulin. And I was looking at the time trial performances of Dumoulin and Froome at the Vuelta and the Giro, both faced in each race Vincenzo Nibali. So I was using him as a bit of a control. And um, over 40 kilometres, Dumoulin took two minutes out of Nibali at the Giro and over roughly the same distance Froome took just under a minute out of Nibali and it's obviously in the time trials where Froome has made the difference in the last few tours grand tours that he's won so it, it creates a very interesting sort of dynamic to the tour but on the race itself today I mean De Mula was absolutely outstanding the rain started falling as he set off really and that made conditions quite potentially slippery there were some cobbles but he was just in a league of his own wasn't he well you mentioned the rain Richard it started to fall just as a last wave of riders set off on the course wave literally yeah and I mean Dumoulin you you wonder he won by just under 58 seconds you wonder what his margin of victory would have been had it been completely dry for him it was a commanding performance caps a fantastic year for him because he won the Giro d'Italia of course and he was every bit as impressive today as he was in the wine trial in Montefalco during the Giro where where he kind of laid the foundations for uh, the pink jersey victory and now he's got a rainbow jersey to go with it but the three talking points um, that I think we should cover in this section are well one of them Lionel is the noise you might hear in the background is actually Lionel and I are playing table tennis (laughs) as we as we do this I mean you you and your you've got your speed golf Daniel we're playing table tennis as we as we podcast We're here. We're not playing table tennis. I'm not sure people will pick up that Probably not. a couple of people are playing on the public table tennis table just over there. Over there. If you Sorry, Lionel, tapping, what are the three topping Well, I think points? the three topics are, one, the fact that the climb at the end made it a, a really interesting, even though the result really was known pretty much from the first time check that De Moulin was going to take the, the gold medal and the rainbow jersey, the climb was spectacular. The crowds were fantastic. 99% of them were absolutely immaculately behaved. There was one uh, quite amusing moment, I suppose, where two security guards or police officers, not sure... Burly, they were, burly fellas. They were very burly fellas. They could have been sort of uh, American football players. They took out a spectator who was running alongside... Um, he was running alongside Tony Martin. Yeah, he was, he was like he was trying to catch him up. Yeah. Tell um, him something. But the climb itself was spectacular. Uh, the big question is, why did the women's race not also finish on that climb? Seems like a missed opportunity. Uh, the UCI uh, sort of shot themselves in the foot a little bit there, I think. Um, the climb also meant that the riders had the dilemma of whether or not to swap bikes. They were all obviously setting off on time trial bikes and then, you know, a number of them swapped to road bikes just for the climb. The first rider off, Alexei Lusenko of 
uh, Kazakhstan had a we had made a real hash of his bike change um, there was a sort of red carpet rolled out on the cobblestones and there was all kind of pre-race speculation about whether the riders would be allowed to have a push or what would be an uh, allowable push off and what wouldn't so there was this, the sense that there might be a sort of farcical dimension to it but actually the decision of whether or not to swap bikes added a dimension of strategy to it that we don't normally see in a, in a time trial and I, th- I thought it worked very well um, just out of interest De Moulin and Chris Froome who finished first and third they stuck to their time trial bikes whereas Primoz Roglic who finished second very impressive second place he swapped to a road bike and uh, climbed up and sort of danced up the hill uh, whereas the other two you know stuck to their time trial positions and it, I thought that made it a spectacle you know to far exceed a lot of world time trial championships I don't know what you two guys thought well it didn't look great at first did it Lionel when you know the red carpet came out and it looked as though Lutsenko was riding on velcro wheels because he got stuck in the carpet um, I was I was half expecting it, the, the Astana Swanya to produce the shake and vac. But then, well, it was quite interesting watching the, the prowess of the mechanics doing the changeovers and the riders themselves. Nelson Oliveira did a very good time trial for Portugal, but it would have been a lot better had his changeover, the bike change, been smoother. Um, and, you know, I, I, I bought slightly at the criticism that came from Tony Martin earlier in the week about the, the course and it not being right that it finished up such a, a steep climb. That would be valid for an Olympic time trial course when there is only one event every four years and that's the only place that the specialists can compete or, you know, for a gold medal in the Olympics. But it, it's every year in uh, World Championship time trials so I think over the course of a career you know Tony Martin's had 10 a dozen chances in his career um, to win a, a rainbow jersey he's won four of them hasn't he so I thought that wasn't really valid that criticism in the same way that we've often maligned the fact that the the road races haven't been varied enough and indeed one could malign that this year's course road race course you know they've gone to the trouble of taking the race to to Bergen and Norway and there is great terrain there for a hillier course and uh, the the course itself doesn't look to be well the kind of route that's going to really suit the climbers Um, it looks more like a puncher sort of sprinter course so I thought that it, it was welcome to have something a bit different in the time trial. Absolutely, I, I think it made it very, very interesting. It was the most interesting time trial I've watched, maybe ever. Um, you know, it made it unpredictable, very hard to really uh, pick a winner. Although in the end, obviously, De Moulin was was the favourite. It was interesting also to see the compare the times uh, up the climb. You know, Roglic, who did a bike change, was the quickest, but De Moulin wasn't far behind. De Moulin took a lot of time out of Chris Froome on that climb. You get the impression, I think, that Froome maybe just hanging on to his form a little bit after the Tour in the Vuelta, whereas De Moulin has obviously trained specifically for this. Um, so, yeah, all in all, I think it was a great success. And as you said, Lionel, the, certainly the, uh, the city of Bergen, the, the people of Norway deserve great credit because it has looked great. The fans have been fantastic as well. And, and the team time trial also, I thought, was a great success. It was really good. A word on the women's time trial, Annemiek van Vluten... Uh, She was very emotional after winning. She's not often very emotional. She's had a great season. She won La Course as well, of course. Um, She doesn't like talking about her crash in Rio at all. I'm not surprised. It was horrendous. No, no, but but inevitably everybody asked her about Mm. it. And, you know, I could tell, Seb PK did the the post-race interviews uh, after the time trial. She's very uncomfortable talking about it. Um, This might just allow her to put that firmly behind her. Well, yeah, I mean, because it was so uh, such a dramatic crash and, I mean, it was one of those ones where you did fear the worst. Um, I suppose until she got a really big win, there was a chance that, you know, she might be defined by that crash. And, you know, certainly in terms of, you know, how hard it must have been to get over that, this is a fantastic result, you know, just a, a year and a bit after... Um, the Rio Olympics ended so badly for her. Um, but Rich, you've you've recently released another episode of the cycling podcast Femina, in which uh, well, you, all are again talked about the difference between women's racing and men's racing. I'm thinking of bunch racing, road racing. But uh, in terms of the time trial, it, there didn't seem to be any justification for not finishing the women's race on that hill as well really I mean, not at all hard to imagine they would have been a different winner because she she looked very good and she's a very good climber as well Annemiek van Vluten it was yeah odd uh, you know good crowds again good atmosphere it looked like but when we saw what we saw today the spectacle of that 
you think, well, why? What on earth was the reason for not having the same course? Especially when the UCI is the body that it doesn't have a great deal of uh, stake in organising road races, and when it then does have an event to organise, it chooses not to showcase. Um, the women's sport on the same climb. It was a strange one. I can imagine it not even occurring to them. I can imagine them just thinking, well, the distance is going to be X number of kilometres, we'll just finish in the town along with the juniors and the under-23 races. The, the wrong decision, really. But, uh, Daniel, what do you think? Is it possible they just forgot? They forgot about the climb. They, they, they knew there was something. <laughs> there was something... <laughs> <laughs> that, they hadn't, <laughs> that they hadn't done when they organised Wolves Race and it was the client they'd just forgotten to put it in I, I don't know I mean I, 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 I don't at what point know. would it have dawned maybe on them I wonder yeah maybe today um, watching the men have they Rich have they made a statement on why it was is there any technical reason is there any conceivable logical reason why it wouldn't have been you know um, to do with well their misguided idea of what, of what it might have done to the results or... I just saw some remarks today uh, that it was logistically and organisationally difficult to use the same climb yesterday but I don't really know why um, maybe you know because there have there, been other time trials age group time trials running the other days perhaps it, it just made it far simpler to, to have them all on the same course but then why not the uh, why not the juniors up there as well? I, d- I don't know. Maybe that's too much, but but it's not really because juniors race up three kilometer climbs. So no, it doesn't. It seems it seems a very strange one that they weren't all riding a variation of the same course. But we'll you know we'll maybe get to the bottom of that. As Lionel mentioned, we have released an episode of the Cycling Podcast Femina this week. We were joined by uh, Bob Varney, Tom Varney from Drop Cycling Team. Lots of good stuff in there, including Mark Cavendish talking about why he has been quite a vocal supporter of women's cycling which is a good interview that Orla did Uh, team time trial Lionel, do you have something else to say? Well, I just wanted to say um, already we're only we're only sort of an hour or so after the race, but there's a sort of a clamour for all future World Championship time trials to finish on a similar sort of hill. Um, we've got Innsbruck, I think, coming up next year, and then uh, Yorkshire, Yorkshire 2019. I think Daniel, as you said, the, the key to the World Championships is to vary it to make a course that favours slightly different types of riders each year. This year is absolutely perfect. Maybe in uh, you know a few years' time when um, the host town or city or region is appropriate uh, they could have something similar but I think to you know to turn it into a kind of a almost a hill climb championships um, year in year out would be just as wrong as having it on a you know a, a flat Tony Martin-esque type course I think the, the, the world championships needs to sort of subtly change things year on year great fun though wasn't it team time trial also an, an event that I think has struggled to capture the imagination since it was introduced into the world championships not too long ago and it's odd because it's a bit of an anomaly in world championship week because it's for trade teams rather than than countries so it's an odd one and as I say it's even been at risk of not being supported by the teams themselves we did see a a good field obviously on Sunday uh, and the, the for the women as well uh, all the big teams there and Sunweb did the double and uh, I think that was a surprise that in the men's race well in both races actually it was a surprise that Sunweb were the winners but also a, a really exciting race a really uh, you know a, a close race um, a race where it looked like Sky were, were going to be the, the strongest team they were, were very quick out of the blocks but really started to struggle when Gary and Thomas uh, struggled on the climb and again quite a tough climb on the course which made it more interesting and Sunweb kept all you, you think you know Dumoulin would be the, the strongest guy but they really rode a very good race and I think both teams had put an awful lot of thought and practice into it they kept their, their riders together for a long time time if not all the way to the finish somewhere which is the key to riding a good team time trial isn't it? Yeah it's an event though for half a dozen teams isn't it? That's the problem with it. I think 11 of the World Tour teams took the start line. There are a lot of Norwegian teams, I'm talking about the in the, in the men's side, the women's field probably greater strength in depth in terms of how, the representation of the, the women's peloton but the, the, the men it boils down to the same handful of teams every year doesn't it? BMC, um, Sky, Orica uh, this year Sunweb uh, Quick Step, of course, 
yeah, it's it, that's that's there's not necessarily a problem with that. The, the rest would be kind of making up the numbers, as indeed the likes of Trek and Astana were really making up the numbers. It's a funny event, though, isn't it? It's I don't know. It doesn't quite fit. It feels like a, a the sort of opening ceremony of the World Championship week rather than a, a, a an event. Also, of that great it's six prestige. riders when at the Grand Tours we see normally nine, we'll see eight next year. We, significant perhaps this year because we, there will be a team time trial in next year's Tour de France. Stage three is going to be a team time trial. We're led to believe over about 30 kilometres and as I mentioned earlier if there's this expected showdown rivalry between Froome and Dumoulin uh, this victory by Sunweb you know that's not necessarily going to tell us how that stage is going to go but it makes it even more tantalising doesn't it Hi I'm James Knox of Team Wiggins and you are listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa I started racing because uh, my brother was a cyclist whilst I was a runner and I generally just became a fan of the sport and wanted to see what it was like racing bikes instead of running. My favourite ride is back home in Kendall. I can do a loop over Kirkson Pass, round Ullswater, back over Sharp, back down into Kendall and then just a little drag home to where I live just south of Kendall. It's got like a lot of nice scenery and a few good climbs, so it's my favourite ride. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kit and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you to our main sponsor, Rafa. We heard there a little message from James Knox, who is, has ridden for Team Wiggins this year, off to Quick Step next year. Um, and uh, yeah, we're very grateful to Rafa for their continued sponsorship of the cycling podcast without their support etc um, and uh, if you're interested in a, a trip next year the Rafa Travel 2018 calendar I know somebody is interested in a trip judging by that expression Lionel the Rafa Travel 2018 calendar is now live at rafa.cc including spectacular new trips to Colombia and Hawaii as well as the classic cycling regions throughout Europe and the USA Colombia of course featured in a recent Rafa film so if that's whetted your appetite go to rafa.cc and check out the Rafa travel calendar for next year Notice uh, you didn't buy anything in the Rafa cafe when we were there earlier, Lionel. You stuck to tap water. I wore rigorously Rafa gear or Rafa shorts and Rafa shirt for the British Speed Golf Open. I don't know if we've mentioned that so oh, far. God, are we going <laughs> to be? Actually, the shorts are fantastic because I could fit... It was a Heathland course, lots of potential for losing balls, and I could fit six balls in the pocket. Amazing. Anyway. Could speed golf be the new cycling? Well, as I said on Twitter, maybe they'll invent speed cycling after this. Yeah, <laughs> anything's possible. Well, that's great, Daniel. I hope that got plenty of media coverage. Um, and I like the idea of you wearing the Rafa clothing rigorously. That's good. Good effort. Uh, so the, I, didn't buy, I didn't buy anything in the Rafa cafe because I, I'd had oh, two coffees already. Let it go. Yeah. I, 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 just, I feel bad now. No, nah, but the way I spent enough for both of us, like, like I ate enough for both of us in there. Daniel, you had another comment about the team time trial, the much maligned team time trial. I did thoroughly enjoy it at the weekend, but you had another point to make about it. There aren't a lot of team time trials in the, the calendar. We, you know, we maybe see a, a handful of them in a season. I think one incentive, one nice incentive for the winners would be the, the opportunity for the whole squad, so anyone representing that team, um, for them to wear a rainbow jersey in any team time trial the following season. I was reminded earlier today, actually, Laurent Jalabert was commentating on French television on the um, World Time Trial, individual time trial championship today. And, and he uh, recalled that he was never able to wear a rainbow jersey when he was World Time Trial champion in 1997. I think um, the World Time Trial jersey, well, that, that could be worn the following year, was only introduced in 1998. I think Abraham Alana was the first rider who was allowed the following season to wear a rainbow jersey in time trials. Um, but of course now it's very much a fixed journey and now it's one of the main reasons why people want to win the World Time Trial Championship. So that would be one thing, but I think the teams do take it pretty seriously. If you watch, I'm not sure if it's been released in the UK or, or indeed generally anywhere in Europe, but the, the documentary that Quickstep had made last year, A Year in Blue, um, a sort of fly on the wall account of their 2016 season, shows very graphically how um, seriously they took 
the World Championship time trial in uh, Qatar last year. So there are a handful of teams that do take it very seriously. And and it's worked. I mean, we saw at the at the Vuelta on the opening day, you know, those same teams filling the top places. And it's because the BMC in particular do put a big emphasis on it. And that can win you a world title, but it can also be extremely useful in, in, in the Grand Tours. Yeah, I mean... I- you talk about a jersey for everyone in the team. I'm not sure about that because I, you... I, I think that'd be a good idea. What? So somebody who doesn't ride in the World Championship team time trial lineup gets to wear the rainbow jersey in a team time trial. Yes, as well. yes, yes. I, I think so, Lionel, because you know the, the the investment that the teams make is very much a it's a collective investment. It's money that the squad spends on you know they have these camps prior to the team time trial championships and they you know, do a lot of work on the bikes and the wind tunnel and so forth and i think anyone who joins that team is is effectively you know they are buying into embracing being embraced by an organization that you know has been rewarded for for all that work that they've done richard's giving me silent grief here i think this is stretching down the road stepping down the road of giving a rosette to everyone um oh. but uh i i do think at the moment they that all the teams get is is a sticker to put on their bus or team car saying that they are the the world time trial champions i certainly think something some kind of logo on the sleeve or or logo on the side i don't know some, something full rainbow white oh, shorts okay. everything that would look fantastic <laughs> in uh all the most nine eight riders all in rainbow jerseys okay each one in a different colour of the rainbow that'd be lovely wouldn't it (laughs) so when they're riding together they look like a rainbow Uh, but they've got to ride in only that order all the way round they're not allowed to swap positions at all that was sort of I don't know if you really understand team time travel Uh, anyway yeah yes Daniel Rich Rich just uh, I was about I was going to interject I can't remember why I think it was when you mentioned BMC a minute ago but this felt like an opportune moment just to mention two curious, interesting withdrawals from the World Championships. One by Manuel Quinziato, who was supposed to be riding his last ever race as a professional in the team time trial for BMC, and he pulled out because he felt that his teammate TJ Van Garderen, I think it was Van Garderen who took his place, um, would contribute more. It didn't work ultimately, but um, I thought it was a very noble gesture that was rightly saluted by a number of Quinziato's fellow pros. He's going to become an agent, or he's actually working as an agent um, I think. We're going to hear from him actually in the final part. Oh, Daniel. you didn't sorry. know this, but so I didn't know um, this. Francois Thomas has spoken to him, but that's fine. That's fine. Just, I know you've got another point to make, but can I just say one thing on Van Garderen? Van Garderen possibly cost them the gold medal because he was the guy they needed him uh, to, for the time because uh, they they'd lost a couple of men, and he was the guy struggling, and they lost a lot of time in the last kilometer or two of the race. So not. Not saying that Kinziato would have been there, I don't think he would have been, but it was Van Garderen of the guys who finished who perhaps cost them the gold medal. Um, another withdrawal from the World Championships, that of um, John Degenkolb, who pulled out of the German team for the road race. And mm. um, again, a very magnanimous gesture. Um, he felt that he couldn't, he wasn't going to be in the, in the form necessary to compete on a course that should suit him, but. It's been a funny old year for Degen Colbin. Indeed, it's been a funny old two seasons since um, his terrible crash for, well, it was what was then, or what is now Sunweb. It was, was it Sunweb at the time? Giant Alperson. Giant, giant Alperson. Yeah, at the training camp in Spain, so at the start of 2016, um, Degen Colbin, of course, almost lost a finger. And since then, you know, if you look, look at his results, he has been very consistent and he, was, he wrote a reasonable classics campaign, but has not really pulled out many victories and he cut a bit of a forlorn figure at the start of the Vuelta I must say and then pulled out after a few days and I think he was sick he had um, some kind of it was throat infection or something along those lines but it's things have not gone particularly well for him in the last um, couple of years I understand that he's still lacking some strength in the arm well the, the hand and the wrist and the arm that were affected in that crash last year um, and um, I think he needs to rediscover some confidence and there's obviously still some physical work that needs to be done for him to get back to his former self he's maybe also haunted by his uh, his, his experience in Qatar last year at the World Championship do you remember he had a terrible loss of temper Remember that? He got very frustrated with one of the Belgian riders, I think. Yeah, they weren't cooperating, were they, with uh, Chase? It wasn't his finest hour, but no. he, do- he does have a bit of a temper on him sometimes, as we've previously discussed. Uh, so looking ahead to the road race, fellas, or the road races, there, there are obviously uh, road races for the, the juniors on the 23s, the women and the men. What are we thinking? I mean, it's always hard, when we've not seen a, a race yet on the circuit, to know exactly 
what kind of race it's going to be. The women, uh, we spoke to Elisa Longo-Borghini of Wiggle High Five in Italy in uh, the cycling podcast Femina. She expects the women's race to be contested by a group of 10 to 15 riders. Giorgia Bronzini is the Italy's fancied rider. She's a, she's a, a you know, a, a, a sprinter who can survive in the climbs. A bit of a maybe Michael Matthews and I don't know if Michael Matthews, obviously he was a key member of the Sunweb team. Uh, that suggests he's going well. I think he's uh, got a world championship win in him. Uh, could this perhaps be his year? Well, it could be, of course. Um, <laughs> it could be. You know, you're straying into into speculation here. This is my least favourite territory. But, um, yeah, the big story is uh, always what kind of rider will the course um, favour. That's what everyone talks about. And as, as we said, I think this time last year, Daniel made the very good point that, that people always kind of get it a bit wrong, don't they? They think this is going to be hard, the hill's going to do this or that, and then, uh, we, you know, the, the race unfolds in a in a slightly different way. Um, this year, of course, the men's race has got the, the run into the, the, the circuit, so it's not laps all the way through. It wasn't the first time it ever been done, I don't think, but I remember Melbourne Worlds um, five or six years ago now uh, had that kind of thing, and it did give it a different feel when, when the race comes in like that because on that occasion, a group got a very big lead, didn't they? And there was a worry that they might complete a lap and actually you know, be on the same point on the circuit as the, um, the bunch, which, of course, will be a, a lap behind. Um, I'm not saying that's going to necessarily happen this time, but it gives the race oh, we a slightly... Know. Well, we, we it happen, well but who knows? It could happen. <laughs> uh, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that when it's just laps, there's a kind of the, the sense that the, the, the pot of water has been put on in the morning and it just you know, comes slowly to a boil over the course of the whole day. It, the rhythm of the race is slightly different, I think, when, when they have this kind of run into the circuit. And then when they first get a look at the circuit and see how it goes, that's what will shape the way the race goes. Um, whether Peter Sagan is going to be fit and raring to go, try to win a third world title in a row, he'd be the first rider to ever do that or whether it will be somebody who's won before Mikhail Kwiatkowski perhaps um, won three years ago now um, you know it's sort of course that could suit him or whether it be somebody new Michael Matthews or Julian Alaphilippe perhaps and then there's a the whole team dynamic Daniel I was looking at the Italian lineup. a lot of talent in there but not a great deal of sort of you know experience obviously nobody's had actually won it before but they've got several options depending on how the course eventually plays out yeah, it looks a really strong team on paper, the Italian team, but they, they haven't won a medal since 2008, which, you know, back then in 2008 would have seemed um, incredible, uh, unbelievable if you'd did, said Did that they not get a 1-2 that day? They Daniel? did. In Varese, uh, Alessandro Balan and Damiano Kuniga were uh, finished first and second. And, um, yeah, since then it's been slim pickings for, for them. They've not, well, it's well documented and we've talked about it a lot that um, Italy has really suffered in the aftermath of that um, series of, well, a, a long series of, of doping scandals which put pay to some of their best riders. And um, they've got some very fast riders in there. Elia Viviani, obviously, is their sprinter. So um, it'll be interesting to see if they work to try and keep the race together together for him I would suggest that they'll be also be sending guys in breaks they've got a lot of guys who would be very dangerous if a break goes early on or even in the sort of um, third quarter of the race so for someone like Alessandro Di Marchi will probably go in a, a break and, and then they've got Matteo Trentin and Trentin um, at the Vuelta looked like looked like one of the best riders in the world I mean a guy who can climb a guy who can ride quickly on the flat and he's very fast in a sprint my one slight reservation about Trentin is that he doesn't have a brilliant record in hard long races or certainly not to date and he doesn't have that much experience being a team leader in very hard long races of 250 kilometers or thereabouts um, also let's be honest the caliber of sprinters at the Vuelta was not uh, nothing like what the guys he's going to be racing against no on Sunday no um, but the course, as you said, Lionel, is a bit of a mystery. The, the climb comes quite early in the lap. There's quite a long run in, um, about 10 kilometres from the top of the climb, I think, and um, which usually points to a, a pretty large group being there at the end. Um, however, the, the climb itself sort of comes in three parts, and I think it might, uh, after all those laps, it might um, start to wear people down. And also, if you look at the recent history of the World Championships, I think... 
Um, we all kind of remember, all those of us who have been watching World Championships for 20 years or so, we, we sort of have a tendency to think that a lot of these races end up in sprints when we, we don't expect them to, that they, they're, not, they're never quite as hard as we, um, we think they're going to be. But actually, in the last five or six years, we've had a lot of sort of solo winners and a lot of uh, races that have been fairly fragmented um, after the final or on the final lap and on the final climb. And um, so I think that there is the terrain there for people to, to attack and make it stick. And, and that even applies to someone like Matthews or Sagan. I think they could conceivably jump on that final um, climb and decide not to wait for the sprint. As Sagan did two years ago in Richmond, Philip Gilbert, who we've not mentioned, another one, he said an interesting thing in an interview in pro cycling this month he said the the easier the course the harder the race you know when it's a a very on on paper very selective course sometimes it there are there are fewer riders who think they can win whereas a course like this there will be lots and lots of riders who who will think they can win and that can make the race an awful lot more aggressive and a a lot harder so it it should be uh should be a great race to watch we know that the there'll be lots of lots of fans out there'll be a great atmosphere it's a very beautiful looking place so uh, i'm really looking forward to it well, we know that the crowd will be firmly behind Edvald Bosenhagen and Alexander Kristoff, of course, the two Norwegian riders who've got genuine medal hopes. Uh, Bosenhagen, of course, won the final stage of the Tour of Britain recently, arguably the toughest stage of the race. Um, it was a bit of a sprint fest there, not necessarily because the course was a, a doddle, but because there were so many uh, top sprinters in the race. Uh, Viviani um, won a stage there as well. Caleb Ewan, who I don't think is riding the World Championships, is he? But he, he also won at the Tour of Britain. But uh, it will be, uh, you know, the, the crowds will be out in force to see Boisenhagen and Christoph. And, you know, they've both been not too bad in the, the, this phase of the season, if you like. Christoph had a bad crash at the Tour de France, but then came good, won the ride, London, Surrey Classic, you know, looked pretty decent that day. Boisenhagen, of course, won a, a stage at the Tour and um, in impressive style and, uh, you know, kept ticking over if the Tour of Britain is anything to go by so you know they I mean they will be watched of course like hawks but it will always come down again to um, the might of the the big traditional teams you know the Italians the Belgians perhaps possibly the Dutch as well they're on a bit of a uh, surfing a crest of a wave and then there'll be the kind of the freelancers the likes of Sagan um, and you know then there's the teams in the middle you know, Michael Matthews is going to be. I mean, this is this is this is <laughs> speculation. What's got into you, Lionel? Yeah, yeah I mean, you could you all could that probably tap write, water. You could it's probably, gone to your head. You could probably write down sort of fifteen or twenty riders' names that you could say. Well, they've all got a really good chance of a, of a medal. It's that kind of race, isn't it? The cycling podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science and Sport for sponsoring the cycling podcast. You can still use the code CPAUG20, CPAUG20 at scienceandsport.com to get 20% off. One or two of you had problems with the code. If you do have a problem with it, just let us know at contact at thecyclingpodcast.com or get in touch with Science and Sport directly. But that will get you 20% off all your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com. So in this final part, um, we're going to hear from our old friend Francois Tomazo, who was recently in Canada for the two World Tour races there. He spoke to uh, a few people, Gordon Fraser, retired Canadian rider, Tyler Farrar, uh, Manuel Quinziato, as mentioned earlier, and we'll hear from them now. So let's over to you, Francois, in Canada. Well, my name is Gordon Fraser, former professional, of course, and now I direct the Silver Pro Cycling Team out of Montreal. Uh, we compete all over North America on the uh, UCI America Tour, and uh, here in Montreal, I do the color commentary. Can you recall, you know, our listeners, what, what you did as a pro rider? What, what was your record like? Well, I think the highlight of my pro career probably was uh, winning the first stage in the yellow jersey at Criterium International. I also won a stage in the Midi Libre and participating in the Tour de France in 97 was definitely a big highlight for me. But most of my career, the bulk of my career was in North America. I raced for Mercury and HealthNet 
uh, almost 10 years in, in the North American circuit and uh, definitely made my name here in North America and had uh, some good success here. We're trying to give, you know, listeners of the Cycling Podcast a little bit of insight on Canadian cycling. What can you tell us about it? Has, has it changed since you, you were a pro rider? Is it changing? Is it improving? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, Canadian cycling has a bit of ebb and flow. Sometimes it's it's up, sometimes it's down. But I think the big picture is it's, it's growing. You know, we have some good races here in, in Canada. The Tour de Beauce uh, is a UCI race. We have the Tour of Delta on the West Coast. Of course, the Gastown Grand Prix in downtown Van- Vancouver. 30,000 spectators at a, at a criterium. So it's it's a crazy scene in Vancouver. In terms of the, the riders, you know, we have five or six full-time riders in Europe now. Michael Woods, seventh place in the Vuelta, which uh, should bode well. We need heroes like Mike Woods. We need role models like that, like I had uh, growing up with Steve Bauer. So uh, with Mike Woods, we have a, a GC contender now. Maybe he can be uh, going to the Tour de France next year with uh, top 15, top 20 aspirations, most certainly. And uh, in terms of the grassroots, I think, you know, there's still important clubs, the Sport Laval here in uh, Montreal, clubs all across Canada. There's lots of good things going uh, out west with uh, some grassroots programs. So I think the, the participation level in Canada is at an all-time high, and now it's up to teams like Silver to create that pathway for developing athletes to aspire to pro careers. So uh, things are in place. Uh, you know, I think the biggest uh, shortfall we have in Canada is perhaps the corporate involvement. We need more sponsorship. We need more uh, revenue streams to uh, help our athletes to progress in the sport. It may be a silly question for me, but living from the on the Mediterranean coast, my impression it's easier, probably easier to, to ride uh, all year round than it is in Canada. Is, it, is that right? Or? Yeah, exactly. Most athletes that uh, obviously are targeting cycling as a full-time profession, they need to go to the someplace warmer to ride. I grew up in Ottawa, but I spent uh, all my winter months in Tucson, Arizona. I, I still use Tucson as my home. But we see, like, my silver athletes, most of them go to Los Angeles. Some go to Tucson. Some of the East Coast uh, riders go down to the Carolinas and, and Florida to train. So, yeah, you, you do have to invest in that off-season. It's very important to get the kilometers in to, to have a good base uh, for the season ahead. So it, it is challenging. Uh, you know, most of our athletes come out of uh, different sports. I came out of Nordic skiing. There's a lot of athletes that come out of hockey, uh, alpine skiing, speed skating, you name it. Uh, so uh, generally cycling is, is rare the first sport of, a, of an athlete in Canada as opposed to Europe where they're growing up cycling at a very, very young age. So we get athletes from a lot of different places. Well, that, that's the case with Mike Woods who was an athlete in the first place. Absolutely. He was a world-class uh, distance runner, went to the University of Michigan. See, a lot of our athletes have to go to the States with collegiate scholarships as well. So we're, we're behind the eight ball a little bit in terms of our infrastructure, our sporting infrastructure, but through Sport Canada and their provincial associations, there's a lot of fun there so but a lot of uh, Canadian athletes do have to go south of the border uh, to pursue their athletic dreams where are the Grand Prix Cyclistes de Montréal what, what impact do you think the, the Grand Prix have been around for eight years what impact do you think they have on the future of Canadian cycling It's huge, you know, the exposure just for a young, uh, if you're not in Montreal, to see the race live, see Peter Sagan, you see Olympic champion Greg Van Avermaet right uh, in front of you. Uh, but this race has good exposure. It's online, uh, on the event website. Uh, it's streamed everywhere. It's in TV all over the world. That's what uh, it needs. It needs exposure at that level to inspire the youth of, of Canada and say, hey, look, cycling is a cool sport. I want to try this sport. I'd, I'd rather do cycling in the summer than maybe soccer or football or, or baseball or something like that. So the more races that have this type of exposure on, on media, on television, on internet, the better uh, cycling has uh, to recruit uh, young athletes. Here I am at the 
the Montreal Grand Prix with Tyler Farrer. Tyler, this is a special day for you. Well, what's happening today? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a moment you don't think about much when you're a young rider turning pro, but uh, today's my final race after 15 years in the pro peloton on a variety of teams from a variety of places. Uh, yeah, this is it. This is the end. So, one last day of racing. How does it feel? It's a bit surreal. Uh, it's not a bad feeling. It's, you know, I'm ready for it. I'm happy with the decision, but, you know, it's it's really been a, an incredible adventure for the last 15 years, something that not many are lucky enough to experience, and, and I'm really glad that I, I had that opportunity. So, you know, it's this kind of rolling circus and a rolling bubble that we all live in, in this world, and, you know, today is really my last day to, to be a part of that circus. Um, no, it's, it's a little emotional, but, uh, like I say, it's a, it's a good feeling, and I'm leaving with a lot of happy memories. Is there any highlights you, you keep in your mind already uh, from these past 15 years? There's so many. That, that's the thing. After after a long career, there have been so many great moments. Um, you know, there's, of course, some victories that were really special. There were some other moments, um, being a part of the team, winning the team time trial in the Tour de France. That will always be one of my highlights. Even just uh, arriving on the Champs-Élysées in my first Tour de France, I think, is probably, for me, the most beautiful moment. Um, but there's so many, just the friendships you make across across the years. You know, we're, we're all in the same hotel here at this race, and you're walking through the dining hall, and you realize you know 90% of the people in there, and it's, it's kind of funny how that works. It's just been a great experience and a great adventure. Well, what is the future looking like, do you think? What are you going to do now? Yeah, uh, I guess it's time for me to figure that out. <laughs> no. um, we have a baby on the way this winter, so I think the uh, the first step is going to be uh, is going to be the baby and uh, figuring out how uh, how fatherhood works. After that, we'll see. Uh, I have a few ideas and a few things in the works. Nothing's concrete yet. Like I say, I'm, I'm looking forward to this next step. Still at Montreal for the Grand Prix, and another rider riding his last race today, and that's Manuel Pizzato. Manuel, how do you feel? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty hard course today, so uh, it's not like the easiest race to do as the last one, but uh, I'm happy. I am really motivated to do the last uh, two races of all the Team Ten Trial Awards. I wouldn't do one more since I'm a fairly complete in 16 years. I was able to finish a good level. I think that's priceless. And, and uh, now I can't wait to start working 100% as an as agent, a rider manager. I really look forward to that because I love cycling, I love to say cycling, and I want to share my experience with you guys. What, what memories could you keep from this uh, long career? What's the highlights or the highlight? Bob. If I have to say, like, uh, the moment, uh, like, the victory I had on Gramont two years ago, for sure, was really, probably was the most special moment, or even better than World Championship we won for the team. And, uh, but I had a lot. I always say that cycling gave me something that not even my parents would give me, because uh, he, he told me that uh, with discipline and uh, commitment you can get everywhere you want. So that was Francois Tomzo, um chatting to a few of the riders in Canada. It's a trip he goes on, I think, every year. Well, yeah, it's lovely to hear Francois' voice nice again, isn't him. it? Um, I've missed him since the tour. Um, but uh, those two races were on the final weekend of the Vuelta, so they sort of slipped through, slipped off the radar as far as we were concerned. But uh, Peter Sagan won the Grand Prix de Quebec and Diego Ulisi won the Grand Prix de Montreal. So, um, you know, maybe a pointer for the World Championship. Ulisi actually is a good, maybe a, maybe a decent outsider. I don't know. Who knows? Um, in good form. Yeah, in good clearly. form. Uh, yeah. Rich, also, I should point out that earlier I said that Matteo Trentin is, is suspect over 250 kilometers. Has won one long race in his career, Paris Tour. Well, of course he has, he, because he has the, the, the Rubin Jaune, which yeah. um, is the prize for the fastest average speed in a race over 200 kilometers, a one-day race over 200 kilometers. So, um, yeah. Voila. There we are. And he is, he's, he's carried his form from the Vuelta, hasn't he? So, um, could be a... 
good show. Um, yeah, there's so many. They, they haven't really got... They've um, got a lot of options, they haven't they? They haven't really got a... Uh, to torture another board game analogy. The Italians haven't really got a king or a queen in their lineup, but they've got they've probably got too many rooks and bishops, and there's going to be um, some sideways and uh, diagonal manoeuvring, I think, when it comes to... Who, who well, you know, you could see a lot of... Um, conflict on the road in the sense that they'll all think oh. they'll all what, from, the mean, Italian, from the Italian team of the world champions <laughs> never get out <laughs> yeah get they'll, out. they'll all ride for one objective definitely absolutely definitely but I, I think that'll be interesting to see won't it we'll be all looking for signs of, of who's getting on and who's who's following the plan what the plan is we'll try and decipher it afterwards you mentioned uh, the Dutch team Lionel Tom de Moula. you know here's a guy you, you know if you saw him at the Bink Bank Tour previously the Eneco Tour he's a good racer as well you know he's not just a time trialist so uh, he's obviously in, in cracking form he knows how to win a race Tom de Moulin could be a, a dark horse takes off and who's going to go with him who's going to stay with him well let's stop naming riders who could possibly well, win should a medal we, should we have a prediction oh, come on well, one, prediction. one name one name okay Go on then, Lionel. You first. Oh, do I have to go first? I'll say Michael Matthews. Oh, oh you! Oh, this is this is the second time this has happened to me this week. I so did this on the second podcast, Femina, where I I went last out of four people, and uh, well, I think I'm still left with, with quite a good gonna, option. If I was going to put some of my own money on the outcome, I think I would choose him, Michael Matthews. Yeah, I think so. But I think it's a good. It's a, it's not a safe bet, but it's a, it's a good bet. It's kind of he'll he'll have reasonable odds as well, so it'd be it'd be worth putting a few quid on. Well, as you know, as you know, Lionel, I was going to say Michael Matthews. We discussed this earlier, <laughs> and he said, if I get picked first, I'm going to say Michael <laughs> Matthews. And lo and behold, that's what he did, and I forgot that conversation. Anyway, you feel like Eddie Merckx <laughs> telling you when he's going to attack and then attacking. <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, you're just like Eddie Merckx. <laughs> The cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, um, a ravenous hunger, never satisfied. Anyway, um, well, I'll go for Peter Sagan then, obvious choice. But, I mean, if anybody's going to win three world titles in a row, Peter Sagan. Peter Sagan. Not, not very imaginative, but there you go. I'm surprised you haven't tried to claim Sagan as your dark horse. That's what you usually do. <laughs> He's a bit of a dark horse, yeah. Yeah, no one's talking about Peter Sagan, are they? Daniel, how about you? Um, I'm going to go. If it's if it's sprintery, then I'm going for Gaviria. So Gaviria, Gaviria is my main Gaviria. name. Gaviria. If it proves to be harder, if the weather's not so good and it's harder than people expect, I think Dan Martin. Oh really? Wow. When you said when you said pick yeah. a pick a name, I didn't know we were going to pick potential winners for different conditions and types of race. Wow. Well, you know, Daniel's thorough like that, isn't he? Well, there you go. Done it. <laughs> there we are. Who's, who's going to be UCI president, Daniel, by the uh, next time we're podcasting? No, I mean, I'm the English chap or the um, French chap, I would, I would say confidently predict. No, I don't know. Um, latest reports are that it's very close. Um, you know, the, the great difficulty with the UCI elections is that no one really understands how it works. We, of course, do. We, of course, do. We're not going to talk about it now, are we? We're going to talk about it next week. We're going to do a review, not a preview, because a preview will take us into the realms of speculation. It'll also take us well over an hour. Yeah. I do. I will always remember being in Florence for the, the previous election, Brian Cooks and Pat McQuaid. That was dramatic and uh, as interesting as these things can ever be, was I it, think. R- Rich, remind me, was that close? I think it was quite close, but I can't really remember now the final score. I can only ever, I can remember it being, seeming like a fait accompli. Yeah, but there was a lot of uncertainty going into it. You know, that's what makes me sceptical about the forecast this time because I, I remember going into it, there was there were really neither side was confident that they would win. Um, I think there, it was very uncertain. So, um, who knows? Well, interestingly, I received an email this week from a sports PR company offering a Brian Cookson interview. Um, as you may remember, I... Well, I've requested an interview with Brian it's quite a few times this year on at least two major occasions. Uh, the first time after all of the uh, stuff with Bradley Wiggins kicked up last year. Um, and I won't say he's swerved it, but he's 
he certainly dropped his shoulder slightly, <laughs> but he swerved it. We saw um, him at the Tour de France, and he did then said, "I will give you that interview, oh, Lionel." Yeah, and then and then just in the week of the world, a week of the election, uh, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, it's not the right time to to just suddenly, uh, you know, uh, be be in a position where we're helping Brian uh, get his last votes over the line potentially. Um, I think we'll we'll take him up on that opportunity if he is re-elected. Uh, we've got some questions that I think um, we would like to ask. So certainly, certainly we do. I think I think we do. And uh, the question, I guess, well, we'll we'll maybe get to this next week when we've got the uh, the election result. But um, the big question is, will it will it make much difference? I mean, the UCI. Um, how much power do they have? But anyway, that's all perhaps for next week when we when we have either a new president or Brian Cookson re-elected and we can uh, look at what they're promising to do. Or more likely the week after because next week we can have some cracking races to talk about. And also we will discuss um, Brian Cookson's first term then, I think, once we... Uh, you know, once we've got a bit more time to do it. There has been quite a lot of race to talk about this week as well. Um, so we should wrap things up. Thank you very much. And Lionel is wrapping himself up as I speak. Yeah, it's cold, isn't it? End of season chill. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Captain.